welcome to the Everyday Miracles podcast, where real life stories of hope and inspiration are shared. Every day, miracles are happening all around us, yet we rarely hear anything about them. Why is that? I'm Julie Hedenborg, and I've committed my time and energy to bring these stories to you, including some of my own personal experiences. My hope is that you'll be impacted the same way that I was. Join me in my journey to inspire change in a world that so desperately needs it. Hey everybody, welcome back to the Everyday Miracles podcast. I'm Julie Hedenborg and I am ecstatic to bring you this episode today. If I could sit down and handpick one person on the planet earth to talk to about near-death experiences, heaven, Jesus Christ, how we reconcile some of these hugely commonly reported things into the scripture uh, or with scripture, it would be Pastor John Burke. <laughs> I'm just so happy that I got a chance to talk with him. Um, who is John Burke? If you haven't heard me mention him over and over, um, I may have even bought you his book. Um, he has been studying near-death experiences for over 30 years. He's, he's researched over a thousand. Um, he's spoken on this topic in over 20 countries to over 200,000 Christian leaders and believers. Um, what do we talk about in this interview? Um, John's personal testimony, how he came to Christ. I uh, found that super interesting. Um, what is a near-death experience? What is the occurrence of these experiences? You will be surprised. Um, what are some of the common features that we see with near-death experiences? Um, what do people see when they get to heaven? Um, who do they see when they get to heaven? My favorite. Um, how do people of different religions interpret these um, versus, versus other cultures or religions. How do we reconcile that? Um, what does the Bible say specifically that, um, that correlates, um, obviously these things can't become the framework of our theology, but I think it's, um, I think it's, it's not smart to dismiss what people are reporting all around the world that is correlating with scripture, um, and it could be possibly a gift from God. Um, so John and Kathy, his wife, they, uh, they are in Austin, Texas. They pastor a church called Gateway, and I'm going to have lots of resources on that for you. Um, the book that we'll be referring to through a lot throughout this interview, which is just one of the books that John has written, is called Imagine Heaven. Uh, Near-Death Experiences, God's Promises, and the Exhilarating Future That Awaits You, and as far as I'm concerned, this is the book that you need to read on near-death experiences. Um, I can't imagine anyone else, like I said, that I'd rather talk to you about this. So thank you, John. Uh, also special thank you to Lilia Samoilo for helping connect me with John. Um, it's just truly an honor. So enjoy the interview. So John Burke, welcome to the Everyday Miracles podcast. Thanks for joining me today. <laughs> Great to be with you. Yes, I'd love to start off kind of giving our listeners a little idea about your history before you wrote this big project. Well, um, yeah, it goes, writing Imagine Heaven goes all the way back, uh, probably 35 plus years. Um, I was an agnostic um, I was an engineer by training, so I've always had a very analytical questioning mind, you know, want to understand how does that work and how do you know? And, and, and so I was always asking the question, you know, like, how do you know there's a God? Um, Jesus, I figured, well, people probably just, you know, like, like good people, right? They, they kind of deify them in time. So that was where I was. I was pretty agnostic. And, um, and my dad was dying of cancer, and someone gave him the very first book that um, talked about uh, when, when people clinically die, and yet modern medicine or miracle from God resuscitates them, and they come back talking about this experience of the life to come. And, um, and as I read through it and hearing the similarities and hearing how many of them experienced this 
this God of love and, and light and life and how many of them saw Jesus. And it just, it made me pause. And I was like, wow, okay, what if this God Jesus stuff is real? And that actually began my, um, my search. And, um, and I ended up coming to faith uh, in, in Christ several years later by reading and studying the Bible. Um, and then years later, I left, I left engineering and I ended up going into ministry. But I've always had this question, this fascination, like, because I, more and more of these what came to be called near-death experiences would come my way. It was like I would meet people and, and we'd get in a conversation and they would, they would tell me about it. I mean, like just this week, the guy who came to trim my trees. Wow. <laughs> we end up in a conversation. He had one. His boss had one. I'm talking to both of them. You know, <laughs> it's like that, that kind of stuff would just keep happening. And so over the last 35 years, I've not only, you know, gone to seminary and studied the Bible and started a, a church for skeptics like me, but also I've studied over a thousand of these near-death experiences. And I wrote Imagine Heaven to show um, just the amazing um, correlation of the commonalities of what people speak about, and we're talking about all across the globe. I've talked to people all across the globe, studied them all around, children, uh, you know, professionals like doctors and, and bank presidents and commercial airline pilots and CEOs saying the same thing as children and, and across cultures. And so for, for me, it was, um, I, I kind of see it as in our modern day global world it's like god is giving us one more line of evidence that he's real and that heaven is real and 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 it's all the things that he's been saying um, through the jewish prophets and through jesus all along and that's what i'm trying to show and imagine heaven is uh, it's it's amazing how they overlap but people don't often have a good understanding first of what you know what what the Bible teaches about the expectation of life to come, but then also how do what these people are saying, you know, how do you make sense of, of that? What are the commonalities? What are the interpretations? Um, because there, there, there can be a difference. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I loved the way you were so analytical in choosing. There's over a hundred experiences in this book. I wish we had time to go through them all. Um, but the amount of scripture that you pull together to kind of support, um, there's got to be what, 40 or so scriptures that you mention in the book? Do you oh, know probably, how many? Probably way more than that. Yeah. I mean, I found, I found 40 common, more than 40, 42 common descriptors of, of heaven and, and hell for hellish experiences that people talked about. Again, commonalities and descriptors all across the globe that multiple people describe. And I show how this is exactly what, what the Bible's been saying all along. Um, and, and so you can see it for yourself. And, and what, what I believe it is is you know, when we, when we read it in the Bible, it's, it's all over. And so you don't really get a, a systematic view uh, very easily, right? I mean, there have been some books written. Randy Alcorn wrote a great book. Um, but, but not often do people see the whole picture. And so what I believe God has done is it, it, it's like he's, he's drawn this picture for us in the Scripture, these stories, I don't believe, are meant to necessarily, you know, add new detail. They're coloring in the picture so that we actually see what God's been revealing all along. And we see it in a way that, that just brings so much hope. I mean, you know, I, I, I believe that what I experienced anyway, and I've heard from many people reading Imagine Heaven, is that by the, by the end of it, you not only see what the Bible says, but you, you, you get a sense of what that's going to be like. And you feel a little bit like you've been there. Yeah. You know, like there's a hope. There's like, oh my gosh, like that's, that's life, but life better than anything I've ever imagined. 
Mm -hmm. Now, if you can, because I know people are chomping at the bit at this point, <laughs> can you share a little bit about what are the what are some of the common things that people experience with an NDE, and how does that paint heaven for us? Yeah, well, and 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 first of all, let me say, you know, these are not uncommon. So the Gallup poll found that one out of twenty five Americans has had a near death experience. Um, even more recently, the European Academy of Neuroscience did a study of 35 countries, and they, they found more like one in 10. So these are not uncommon, but people are hesitant to share them. And, and, and that is because, uh, for instance, one of the commonalities is that people will say it was more real than anything I've ever experienced. All right, well, what does that mean? Because this is all we've ever experienced. What's more real than this? Mm -hmm. Well, and, and so I use an analogy to help people understand because after interviewing so many people, I'm convinced of this. They're experiencing new dimensions of time and space. So imagine this. Imagine if we're living in three dimensions of space, one dimension of time, right? Mm -hmm. But imagine if this experience we're having is actually being lived on, on a flat black and white painting on your wall in your living room. And, and death means separation. So our spirit is separated from our body at death. So imagine at death, then your flat two-dimensional being is torn off that two-dimensional painting, but now you're brought out into this three-dimensional space that was all around you all the time. You just couldn't conceive of it because you didn't have a third dimension. And now you're experiencing new dimensions and color, and then you get pressed back into the flat black and white, and you have to describe in two-dimensional black and white terms what this three-dimensional world of, of color is like. Mm -hmm. And that's what I'm convinced people are they're grasping to do. It's also why I think you read some of the things like pictures of heaven in, in, in the book of Isaiah or in Revelation, and it sounds weird or gaudy, kind of cheesy, like streets of gold, you know? And, but, but he actually says, clear as crystal. Well, gold's not clear as crystal. And so there are all these things that they start to make sense and you start to get a picture of it when you, when you realize that they're, they're describing something truly um, beyond the limited dimensions that, that we live in. And of course, that makes complete sense. Science um, postulates that uh, we, we have five to 11 dimensions that we can't see just to explain how uh, general relativity and, and quantum physics actually fit together. So this is not, you know, it's not unknown to science, which always fascinates me because sometimes it's hard for scientists to imagine there's a heaven, which I don't get, because they absolutely think there are other dimensions we can't see. So anyway, back to, yeah, commonality. So when people, when people die, they say that they leave their bodies, um, but they have an, a new spiritual body. And, and so they're still themselves. In fact, they're more themselves, they say, than, than they ever were. And not with five dimensions. It feels, I mean, five uh, senses, it feels more like they have 50 senses. So it's kind of like they have, and, and sometimes they'll talk about it in ways that I think if Christians don't really know the Bible, it freaks them out. And here's what I mean. So they'll say things like, yeah, it was like I had superpowers, well, that sounds like, you know, fantasy fiction. Yeah, you know, superhero, right? But, but actually, you know, I believe that Paul, the Apostle Paul, who wrote a good chunk of the New Testament, actually had a near-death experience. In Acts chapter 14, it says he was stoned to death in Lystra by a mob, a crowd that turned on him, drug out of the city and left for dead. And then all his companions rallied around him and prayed for him, and he revives and goes back in the city. Now, Paul talks about that. I believe he's talking about that in 2 Corinthians 12 when he talks about himself and says, you know, 14 years ago, whether in my body or out of my body, I don't know, but I was taken up into heaven and shown and seen things inexpressible, shown and heard things inexpressible. So Paul then writes about this new spiritual body in 1 Corinthians 15. 
He talks about the, our, our, our bodies are buried, natural bodies, but they're raised spiritual bodies. They're buried in weakness, but they're raised in dunamis, power. That's the Greek word, power. So what people are saying, this new spiritual body has new powers, is exactly what Paul said of his own uh, experience. And, and, and some of these, um, you know, like people say things uh, like, like Heidi, who was, uh, she was actually a trauma nurse. Um, have you, she's not in Imagine Heaven. No, I know she was just interviewed recently, and Lily has mentioned her, too. Yeah, I connected them up. Yeah, so um, I'll, I'll tell more about her story uh, later because it's just fascinating. But, but she basically said she had telescopic vision, and it was like she could see for thousands of miles to, this, to heaven and see every blade of grass, every leaf on every tree, every, everything. And, and you go, okay, well, that's kind of wacky. That's, it's actually in the Bible. So in Revelation chapter 21, John, one of Jesus' disciples, right, mm -hmm. is he, he says he's taken up into heaven and he's brought up onto this very high mountain um, looking over the city of God, the new Jerusalem, right? This is Revelation 21, which, by the way, you know, uh, Captain Dale Black and a commercial airline pilot describes that exact thing. Other people have described the exact same thing, and, and it helps you get a sense of, okay, what is this? What's it like? But John says he's up on this very high mountain, and he reads the names of, of the apostles on the foundation stones and the archways of, of the city. So if he's on a very high mountain, how in the world can he read that? unless he has telescopic vision. Mm -hmm. So there are all kinds of correlations like that that you don't necessarily see, but I think God is, is allowing us new insights into even what the, what the scriptures have said. So people, when they leave their body, they're, they're actually able to see what's happening in the room many times with their resuscitation. We don't have to get into that right now, but it's actually what convinced me as a skeptical engineer, these are real. And it's what has convinced many cardiologists and oncologists, you know, doctors, and you, you as a trauma nurse and as a, uh, a nurse have seen probably, you know, when people come back and what they can describe and it can be verified. So it's like they couldn't have otherwise known unless what they're saying is true, that they still had a body, a spiritual body, they were there. Mm -hmm. So then commonality as well is that... Um, Many will, will, will say they travel. And, and some, um, it's like a tunnel that opens up and, and they travel into it toward this place of light at the end of it. Um, some, it is a tunnel of light. Some, it's a pathway of light. Some, it's like traveling out of the hospital and the earth goes away and they are being escorted by angels on this pathway of light through through the universe. And, and so, you know, it's not just a one, one size fits all, you know, like, oh yeah, the tunnel and the light. And well, no, it, it's, it's more than that. And, and I think God makes it personal uh, to people as well. Like I said, he allowed this commercial airline pilot to come flying in winged by two angels into the holy city of God. Mm -hmm. And, um, You've, you've read that description in chapter eight of the beauty of heaven, probably, and the way he writes about what he saw is just like, oh my gosh. Yeah. You know, it's just, I mean, it gives me goosebumps just thinking of, you know, the beauty. And that's, you know, that's where people end up. It's another commonality many times is they find themselves in this, this, this place, or it's not one place, and they don't describe it. It's just kind of like, you know, if you came to Earth as an alien, you might come in Central Park in New York City, or you might come in downtown, or you might come in Iowa, and you wouldn't describe it all the same. Yeah. And, and that's what I remind people is the life to come is a vast world beyond ours, but it's not unlike ours in that God's created similar beauty, mountains and trees and, and forests, trees, same species, but also new species, flowers, and, you know, just... I mean, people say it's just gorgeous times a thousand. Mm -hmm. 
And another commonality that people will say is that um, there, are, there are colors beyond our color spectrum. That's common across the globe. They're just enthralled by, by the colors. And interestingly, that correlates with another factor, that light is coming out of everything, including sometimes coming out of the people that they meet, which is another commonality that they have a, a welcoming committee many times made up of their loved ones who have gone on before them or their close friends many times who had a spiritual input in their lives or they had a spiritual impact on, on the other person's life. And these people come to greet them and it's like this great reunion uh, of love and it's like the love and the life and light is bursting out of these people. Now all this may sound like, again, like, uh, I don't know, but it's biblical. So first of all, Jesus said, um, I think it's in uh, Luke chapter 13, uh, use your worldly resources to make friends so that when all your worldly stuff is gone, they will welcome you into an eternal dwelling. So I believe that's exactly, because it's consistently what happens is there is a welcoming committee uh, of people who are there to welcome and uh, escort that person into this, uh, help, help them acclimate to this new life, which you would think will acclimate. Well, yeah, we are still ourselves. And it's like the journey continues, but into a whole new realm. Mm -hmm. It truly is. It's like a whole new realm, a whole new adventure um, of life, way beyond what we have experienced here. That light coming out of people, I believe is actually the light and the love and the life of God. People say this, this light is not like the light of the sun. Um, it's palpable. And, and it is also love, and it's also life. And this is exactly what the angel tells Daniel in Daniel chapter 12. It says, at the end of time, you know, everyone will be resurrected, some, some away from God, some toward God, and those who are righteous will shine like the stars forever. Mm. That, so that's, that's in Daniel, an Old Testament prophet. Then Jesus says, um, same thing. And then the righteous will shine like the stars in their father's kingdom forever. So, so we never think about that. But, you know, it says in, um, you know, Paul talks about in Romans chapter 8 how we will share in the glory of God. And he says, you know, we will share in the glory of God if we share in his sufferings. Mm -hmm. So like even as we go through the hardships of life, as we, as we stay faithful to God, and never perfectly, never perfectly, we, you know, we all, we all struggle. But every little act of faith, every little act of trust, every little deed of kindness, all these things, you know, God is a rewarder it says. And, and part of that reward is sharing in his glory. Well, what if his glory is the very life and love and, and, and light of the world that we experience coming out of us? You ever experience just overflowing joy? Like those moments where you're just like, you know, it's kind of that top down music blaring, like beautiful day. And you just are about to burst with excitement for something or you know, you feel so in love or, and we've all had a little bitty taste on the tip of our, of our tongue, but that is a taste of, I believe, eternity, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. So all this, all this stuff, I mean, even, even in Revelation 21, John says, and, and in Isaiah 60, there is no sun or moon in heaven for the, the, the Lord is the light. Jesus is the lamp. And the nations will walk in that light. So the fact that people like, I love uh, Vicky and Brad were two blind people that I report in Imagine Heaven. Amazing. <laughs> oh, yeah. And blind people see the same things. When they die, they can see. So, so Vicky, um, Vicky, you know, leaves her body. She, she, uh, at first is like what's going on because she can see the car accident where she died. And then later in the operating room, you know, the doctors and nurses 
frantic. And yet she said, man, I felt great. I don't know what they were so upset about. (laughs) She realizes from her long hair and, and her orange blossom ring, that's me. I must be dead. But she felt great. She was like, I'm good. And she said, I know I knew where I was going. And she said, I'm, I'm out of here. And um, she, she was a believer in Jesus. She takes off out of the hospital. So she flies up out of the hospital, sees, you know, kind of the, the, the cityscape around and, and then ends up going through this, this tunnel uh, to a place where she comes out. And it's like a, it's like a, a garden with beautiful grass and trees and, and flowers and this, this large grouping of people. And, and she said it was like light and love was coming out of everything, out of the birds, out of the trees, out of the grass, out of the people, and all of it was conveying love to her. And then she sees her two um, friends who died when they were 9 and 11. They grew up together in a home for blind uh, children. And um, she sees them, Diane and Debbie, and they had passed away, and they were in their prime and completely healthy, she said. And then she sees Jesus, and he is brighter than all the rest by thousands, way brighter than the sun, they say, but not hard to look at like all you want to do is look at him. And he gives her this huge hug. And she said it, w- it wasn't like a hug like you get on earth. It was like, it's like a hug where you become one. And it's just hard to explain it. But like she said, he, he, he saw right through me. There was nothing I could hide, but I didn't want to hide anything. And as she looked into his eyes, and this is what people often say, like she was just lost. Like I could just stay there forever. You know, in, in, the, in the being known and the sense of, I, I, I now fully know who I am and what I was created for and experiencing this love and, and peace and joy coming from God. So, so all of that, you know, what, what Vicki was saying, fascinating too, when she came back, she couldn't see. Mm-hmm. And, and the researchers that, um, that I quote in Imagine Heaven interviewed the house mother where she grew up. And another commonality we'll talk about is a life review. And Jesus gave her a life review. So she saw her life play out again. And she saw the way Diane and Debbie, her friends that she grew up with, struggled in their movements and what they looked like. She didn't know that. She was blind. And she was able to describe that to the house mother in front of the researcher. And the house mother said, yep, that's that's accurate. Wow. And there was the shoe too, right? Was she the one that saw the shoe on the ledge? No, that, that was another one. That was oh, at a hospital okay. in Seattle. Okay. And um, yeah, just another one of the corroborative evidence stories. Uh, she left her body and was, you know, there in the hospital still. And she finds herself outside the hospital and notices a, a shoe, particular shoe. I, I don't remember all the details. I think it was like a left red shoe, tennis shoe with a shoelace tucked under the heel. She, she describes this on the ledge of a window, like some kid had thrown it up there, um, you know, several stories up. Or, and, um, and so when she comes back to her body, she convinces the nurses to go check it out, and they do, and they find the shoe. There's another one that, um, that we talk about. Uh, actually, it's in... It's in a follow-up, What's After Life? I don't think it's in Imagine Heaven, but um, a woman in London who uh, died giving birth, and, and she's up on the ceiling of the, of the emergency room, and she also has this experience of travel and experiences this God of light and love. But as she's coming back, she's coming back into the room, going to enter her body, and she notices a red sticker on the top side of the ceiling fan, the ceiling side of the ceiling fan. And she comes back, and she's trying to tell the nurses and doctors this amazing place she's been and this incredible God she experienced and, you know, all this stuff. And they're like, yeah, it was the, you know, it was the anesthesia, 
which I'd love to ask you that question. <laughs> yeah, they always blame everything on us. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, you know, uh, so, so she finally convinced uh, a, a nurse and who, who went and got help, got an orderly to help, got a ladder, went up and found the red sticker she was talking about on the top side. Gosh. And, and, and that's fascinating, but that's not uncommon. So uh, Dr. Jan Holden did a study of these kinds of uh, out-of-body during a, a near-death experience observations that could be checked out. And uh, of 93 patients who each might make, you know, 10 or 20 observations, right? She found that of those observations, 96% were completely accurate. I mean, I'm sorry, 92% were completely accurate. 6% were mostly accurate. In other words, they may have made nine observations that were completely accurate, and they may have gotten one detail wrong on, on something else. Only 2% were, were inaccurate. Mm. You compare that to, a, to a, a, um, a sample of people who had had cardiac arrest trying to describe what went on in the room, and it's like 10% accurate. Wow. <laughs> wow. Well, yeah. and I know I want to make sure we get to this next question because, and you've touched on it already. This is amazing. I just want to highlight the man of light. Um, you've talked about Jesus a little bit. Now, again, you started out as an agnostic. I'm curious, you know, a lot of people say they're seeing Jesus. We even have a lot of videos out right now. Like I came back with a message from Jesus. Now we have to always use discernment with all of these, obviously, but how many people roughly see Jesus? And can you tell us anything else about Jesus that you haven't already? Yeah. And um, what I found fascinating is that the God that people describe across the globe, and it doesn't matter what culture they grew up in, it doesn't fit cultural religious expectations. In, in other words, um, in India, so I report a, a study done of 500 Indians, the continent of India, and, uh, and 500 Americans. And, and the study was actually trying to, to see, okay, well, how much does religious upbringing affect what people report? in this experience. Now, again, people can interpret any way they want, but what do they actually say they, they, they saw? What do they report? And, and what the researchers said, and the, these researchers were, um, were agnostic. They were actually trying to say, it's not Christian and it's not Hindu, it's something other. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, I'll, and, I'll, and I'll explain. And I think I, I think I did go into it in Imagine Heaven, but they said, you know, that the Indian patients um, never talked about the Vedic loci of the Hindu heaven. Um, they didn't talk about dissolution into Brahman, the ultimate form of this impersonal God. They didn't lose their personality, um, and 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 they didn't uh, they didn't talk about reincarnation. They said they might have been referencing karma. And karma is the idea of um, kind of merits and demerits. It's kind of the you reap what you sow. Right, you know, you sow folly, you're you're going to reap the consequences. But karma is a little bit more. Um, you're going to pay, and you're going to pay in this life, and the next, and the next, until you get it right. <laughs> and so they were saying, well, maybe they were referencing karma when they talked about seeing uh, a a man in a white robe with a beard and a book of accounts, which which recorded their 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 life, basically their life review and all their deeds. Well, so what I, what I show is that well, that actually is more the Bible than it is the Vedas, the Hindu scriptures. And, and I've studied the scriptures of the world's religions. Um, I've read much of the Vedas, uh, the Tibetan Book of the Dead. You know, in, in, in their descriptors of the life to come, I found four maybe to six uh, commonalities with those 40 common traits, but that was about it, you know? So, mm -hmm. so some may say there's peace on the other side. Okay, there's one, right? Mm -hmm. um, all of them say there, there is a hell, interestingly, mm -hmm. all of them. 
In fact, yeah. the, Buddhist, the Buddhist one is the roughest, <laughs> quite honestly. Wow. But that's two. I know, I know. People don't know. They just, they just go with what's heard on the street. But, but like I was saying, the Bible, there are, I, I'm showing how there are 40 plus of these commonalities and, and, and how they align. Now, what the, those researchers said about the American um, experiences, the near-death experiences, was that when people got this life review in the presence of this God of light and love, they felt no judgment. They felt no condemnation. Um, even though they were, so the life review, you're seeing, you're like three-dimensionally watching your life replay. And what they say is not only not only are you seeing the good and the bad, you're feeling it. What, not only what, what was going on inside of you, but how it was affecting the people you were interacting with. The good and the ripple effect of it to others, and the bad and the ripple effect of it to others. And I believe it's just exactly what Jesus said when he said nothing will be hidden. Every motive, every deed, every thought will be laid bare. Now, what, what, what Paul also says is that so God can reward us. And that's an important thing because people hear that and they're like, oh, crud, you know, <laughs> I, don't, I don't want that, right? But, but again, you know, you got you to gotta hear all that, that God is saying. Like, he's not wanting to condemn us. And that's why it actually lines up. You know, it says in, in Romans 8, 1, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. In other words, what God was doing through Jesus was paying for all our wrongs so that we don't feel judged or condemned or shame for even, even the wrongs we've done. Now, why? Because people are like, well, that's not right. That's not fair. Well, the why is because we were created for God. We were created to live in relationship with God. And when we, when we reestablish that, when we don't let the, 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 the going our own way rather than God's way keep us from God, then he can actually, God can actually begin to grow us from the inside out. That's why he forgives us. So when people experience no condemnation in front of this God of light and love, even as they're seeing their own story play out, what they commonly say is God wasn't condemning me. I was condemning myself. I was my own worst judge. And God was just trying to love me and support me and help me learn. And, and the thing they come back saying they learned is God is love and how we treat one another is what matters most. Love is what matters most. Well, again, all this, Jesus said, Moses said it, right? I mean, to love God is the first and greatest commandment, right? Yes. Jesus said the same thing. Love God and then love your neighbor as much as yourself. They can't be separated and they're the two greatest commandments and they sum up the whole Bible. That's what Jesus said. Yeah, and that perfectly ties into another question that I had was, you know, knowing these experiences are, some of them are real and they're huge correlations that things that are in common that point right into scripture. It has profound implications for how we're living our life now. So, you know, loving God and loving each other. And um, I think these people, they must have a whole new lease on life when they come back. But um, I want to talk to those people that that might not know Jesus. <laughs> um, I encourage them to read the book. And I, I did want to talk about hell, but we're running a little short on time. Hell is real. Um, there's at least three in here that are that are just really powerful. Um, well, of those who report near-death experiences... Um, twenty three percent came back reporting hellish experiences. So we have to we have to account for that as well. Yeah. But here's but the good news, and you and you can read it in that in that chapter, yeah. is that God is so loving and so merciful, and has done everything. What He did through Jesus was remove every barrier between every human and Himself, except one barrier. There's only one: mm -hmm. our pride. You know, our stubborn pride of, I don't want you in my life, God. I want my, I want to be in control. That's the only thing. Us choosing to keep God out is the only thing that can keep God out. 
Other than that, you know, even in these hellish experiences that, I mean, I've got three pastor friends who had hellish experiences. One was a tenured college professor. One was a cocaine addict. The other was a college um, alcoholic. All of them atheists had these hellish experiences. And in the middle of it, still God was reaching out to them and they cried out to him and they experience Jesus forgiveness. They come back. All three of them become pastors. Wow. And I received someone that emailed me that had a very similar to one to Howard Storm. Yeah. He, he did not want to share and that was okay. I was glad he shared with me, but so compelling. Okay. So let's talk a little bit more about the hellish experience. I have a very smart friend who asked me recently, Julie, how could, if God loves us so much, how could he send anyone to hell? Um, we have people that don't believe in hell. Obviously you've, you've seen these experiences. What can you say about that? Yeah. One is that if you're going to accept the good ones as real and legitimate, then you got to take the bad ones as real and legitimate as well, because 23% of people who come forward talking about near-death experiences talk about theirs was a traumatic one, a a hellish one. And it too is the same like Jesus described, a place of of outer darkness. Um, And he said, where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. You know, what does that mean? Well, what you got to understand, you know, because like, like your friend, yeah, does God send people to hell? Well, I tend to agree with what C.S. Lewis um, says. He, he was a, an Oxford professor, atheist, who became a Christian, as, as he said, dragging his heels the whole way, but the evidence got him there. And, and he later wrote about how God, he doesn't think God sends anybody to hell. People send themselves because they truly want to play God more than they want God to be God. And, and, and this is a very critical thing for also understanding the question, why does God allow so much evil and suffering in our world? Because we assume that God is doing that, but what he says is that he's actually put us into a lesser experience of life to protect us, I think, from, from how bad it can be but it also keeps us from seeing how good it can be for a short amount of time, 70 years, 100 years at the most. And we experience little taste of, of the love and the life and the light and the joy and the peace and the good gifts of God. But we also experience a taste of what is it like when free will creatures try to play God and I, get, I want my will be done in my life, in your life, and in heaven too. And when God doesn't do things my way, I shake my fist at him and I tell him to go away. And the the thing we don't realize is that's sin. All the other things that we call sin, they all come out of that one big S sin of playing God. And that's what causes the majority of the chaos and suffering of this world. So the Lord... I believe has allowed it for a, a, a reason and a time that we, we are learning as free will creatures. And, and why has God created us free? Why does he give us this much freedom? Because sometimes it's like, you shouldn't, right? We, we blame God. Why are you giving people free will to abuse like that, mm-hmm. right? But what if he's also doing uh, doing it in mercy in the sense of greatly limiting how bad it could be to show us why we want God's will and ways, not our will and ways ruling. That's a very critical thing. But, you know, if, if, you, if you believe, if you start to realize how um, God foretold the coming of Jesus so that we could know evidentially I actually didn't come to faith in Jesus because of near-death experiences. I came because of the historical evidence. As an engineer, that's what convinced me. And then if you realize that, you know, evil is not just present in our world. It's present in the world to come. In other words, God created other species. He created angels. And some angels who were also free will creatures chose to rebel against God. 
They wanted their will and ways done. Well, in eternity, there is no place where God, his love and light and life don't rule. So he, in his, I don't understand it, infinite wisdom, gave them what they wanted. So hell is where the angels rule themselves without the light and life and love of God. And Jesus said, hell was never created for people. And he said, it's not God's will that one single person would go there. So back to what C.S. Lewis said, the only thing that can separate us from the love and life and light of God is us saying, I don't need you, God, and I don't want you. What God claims that he's done, and I think what these near-death experiences, what I try to show in Imagine Heaven is that these near-death experiences just support all that he says and all that he's done is that God is love. He created us with a free will because there can't be love without a free will. If, if, I, if I fall in love with someone and I want, I want that person to love me and they don't, what do I do? Put a gun to their head and say, love me. Well, we all know you can't force love. That's not true love. And same with God. So what he claims he did is that Jesus made a way to pay for our big sin and all the little ones together so that all it takes for someone to know that they're right with God forever is a heart turning back to him in faith. Mm -hmm. In other words, what, what he did in, in Jesus is make it so easy that someone turning back saying, God, I want what Jesus did to count for me. I want your forgiveness. I want you to be leader of my life. You created me for your love. I want to trust you. I want to follow you. Mm -hmm. and, and it doesn't mean we'll follow him perfectly. We won't. We'll struggle. We'll stumble. But Jesus went through that too to show us that, you know, he understands the pains and the struggles and the temptations and the suffering, and he'll help us. He wants to help us through it. Yeah. And yes, that's excellent. Thank you for explaining all of that. Um, oh, there's so much more I want to squeeze out of you. <laughs> um, I'm going to, I'm going to list so many different uh, references. I know one that you just said that I know someone is going to ask me about. You said that the historical evidence, um, obviously your book, my, it's my favorite book outside of the Bible. I promise you, this is my favorite book. Um, Excellent. Well, Bible's better. I would recommend oh, yes, it first. It's better than any book, yes. Um, but you mentioned the historical proof. Is there a book that if someone's questioning, like, well, what kind of historical proof is there? Is there a um, case yeah. of Christ or is there a reference you can recommend? Yeah, I would definitely um, reference the case for Christ. Uh, Lee Strobel um, is, is a, a good friend of mine. He was an atheist, uh, a legal editor for the Chicago Tribune. He was a Yale-trained lawyer. And um, his wife became a follower of Jesus, and he set out to get her out of it, basically show her why this is wrong. And when he actually started looking at it, it convinced him. Mm -hmm. And so the case for Christ is his own legal looking into and, and realizing, which, by the way, that's, I mean, there, there are many books written by lawyers who have been convinced when they actually looked at the, at the evidence. Mm -hmm. um, I actually, in the appendix, in one of the appendices of Imagine Heaven, I put an abbreviated uh, reference to what convinced me, which, which was actually, um, we have in our possession today, because of the Dead Sea Scrolls, copy of the book of Isaiah predating Jesus. So, so you can literally online read the Hebrew and the translation of, a, of the book of Isaiah older than Jesus. Wow. Phenomenal. People don't know this. In the book of Isaiah, God tells us how we can know he's the one true God. And he says, it's because only I know what's to come. And then he goes about saying how the Messiah is going to come to Galilee as a child, as a son, in the line of David, and, and bring everlasting peace. Then he talks about how he's going to be the suffering servant who is pierced through his hands and his feet for the sins of the world to bring us healing and wholeness, how he's going to be buried with the rich and, and the poor in his death. Well, he was supposed to be thrown into a mass grave with the thieves, 
But Joseph of Arimathea, a rich Pharisee who became a believer, actually put Jesus in his own tomb. That's in Isaiah 53. And that after he suffers for our sins, he will see the light of life and bring many children to God. That's in Isaiah 53. Proof positive written before Jesus was ever born. And God in it tells us, this is how you'll know it's me. Wow. So I give it just a little, that's what I'm saying. It's like, as an engineer, I came to faith because I was like, and, and there's more, there's much more. I mean, whole history of nations, of what he's done with, with the Jewish nation. He foretold the rebirth of the Jewish nation. You know, Jesus, at, at the week before he was crucified, he wept over the city of Jerusalem, and he said, you know, if only you had known what would bring you peace, you know, but now your enemies are going to come against you, and they're going to scatter you across the nations, you know, until the time of the Gentiles is fulfilled. Now, that's fascinating, because the Jewish people in 70 AD, so 40 years, a perfect 40 years after Jesus' crucifixion, Roman general uh, Titus levels the city of Jerusalem levels the temple, which is important because the temple has still not been rebuilt, and sacrifice to forgive the sins of the Jewish people had to happen every year in the Jewish temple in Jerusalem, and yet it can't now, but Jesus was the final sacrificial lamb. It's, I mean, there's so much, Julie, like, and, and if people took the time to see, they would see. But anyway, I give a little piece in, uh, in the appendix there. I think the case for Christ is a great one. Um, one a little bit from an, a, another era, but another perspective is C.S. Lewis, um, uh, Mere Christianity. Uh, I mean, if you're, a, if you're a scientist, Hugh Ross is an astrophysicist who's wrote, wrote, written a ton on um, astrophysics and science and how it just confirms uh, you know, it shows us more of God. It doesn't, doesn't negate. Um, same with even uh, uh, blanking, head of the Human Genome Project. Uh, I can't remember his name right now. I'm just, oh, Francis Collins. Sorry, Francis Collins. Mm -hmm. So he was the head of the Human Genome Project that decoded our DNA and he, during that, came to faith in Christ and, and wrote a book about it as well. So you're talking about very smart people, you know? And, and, and that's the thing I, I like to say is, if you want God in your life, there's more than enough evidence to prove he's there. If you don't, he gives you the freedom to find supporting things to keep him out. Because he doesn't force us. Yeah. So someone's listening and um, they want to take, say they want to take the next step to accepting Jesus. What do they do? I mean, truly God already knows your heart, you know, and that barrier of our own pride uh, is the only thing that can get in the way. And, and a great picture of this is Jesus. When he was dying on the cross, there were two thieves who were probably murderers as well, um, insurrectionists, and they were being crucified on either side, and one of them, you know, basically did what some of us do, and like, hey, if you're really God, if you're really the Messiah, prove it, and get me down off this cross. And Jesus didn't even answer him, because it was a haughty, okay, God, prove yourself, or forget it. God doesn't respond to that, but the other thief said, what are you doing? He, he's not guilty. We're guilty. In other words, he admitted that he recognized, you know, I've done, I've done wrong. I'm not perfect. And he also just had the little inkling of faith to say, you know, Jesus, when you come in your kingdom, remember me. That's all he asked. And Jesus said, you'll be with me today in paradise. That is the amazing grace of God, right? All yes. he needs is a heart turning to him. So what I tell people, it's not the words, it's the attitude of your heart, and God knows your heart. And you don't have to do it perfectly. I mean, anyone who calls on the name of the Lord, he says, will be made right with him. Mm -hmm. And so just, you know, something like, God, I 
I want what Jesus did on the cross to count for me. That, that I would know my sins are forgiven, and that's past, that's present, that's even the future, things you'll do wrong. And so the way to look at it is like, when you turn your heart back to him, he says, awesome, that's what I was waiting for. And then he says, not only does he forgive us, he adopts us as his children into his family. And then he wants to walk with us through life to grow us up into more and more spiritually mature followers of Jesus, you know, who can bring life and freedom and, and, and good gifts to others, who can love our neighbors just like he loves us. Excellent. Excellent. And I'm attaching so many things. One thing I saw on your blog, um, if you can tell people quickly how to get a hold of you, um, how can they find more on you? Easily? Yeah. So um, I think you would ask me about groups and things like that. Yeah. Um, so gatewaychurch.com is, is the church I pastor and it's a church for skeptics and believers. So people who are just wanting to explore faith, that's we started it because we believe that God wanted a place where people could come as you are mm -hmm. with your doubts, with your struggles, with your past, no matter what, because that's how he accepts us. And then you can get in, in, in groups and begin to grow um, more and more from there. You don't have to know the Bible. You don't have to have all the answers. So we have an online campus um, and, and, and you can just join and watch that. Um, you can also get in online groups. They're happening actually all across the world. Um, of people who are exploring faith and finding faith. Wonderful. And I know my faith grew a lot when I joined a Bible study. And I, at first I felt really intimidated. Um, yeah. but everybody was, you have to, you might have to try a couple groups to find a, the right fit, but it will really help your faith. Um, and they love pouring into new people. It's, it's really neat. Um, one thing I saw on your blog that I just want to point out that would make an amazing Bible study. Um, you have a book, obviously imagine heaven, and then you have a devotional and you have six weeks full of, um, sermon manuscripts, there's discussion guides, there are interviews that you can use in your teachings, um, all kinds of different resources that I found there. And that would be what a great time to do a study with this book. Um, we need to, you know, this, the joy of heaven awaits us. And like Paul said in Romans, and you've mentioned Romans a few times, um, our current sufferings, which there are a lot of, there's a lot of suffering right now, but it just doesn't compare to the glory of heaven and everything that's coming. Um, so John, this has been amazing. I know I've taken up so much. Thank you for your time today. Oh, um, you're welcome. Can you please pray over my listeners um, on the way out? Absolutely. Okay. Jesus, thank you uh, for your goodness, for your kindness, for your love and your grace and how you continue to show us more and more evidence of yourself. And I believe that, you know, in our in our global age, when people are connected all across the globe, um, in our age of modern uh, science and medicine and resuscitation, I think you're giving us even more evidence as these people are coming back to report about you, um, seeing you, Jesus, and, and the one who said, I am the light of the world, the God who is love. And we just thank you for that. And I pray for all the people listening God, that they would get a, a clearer and clearer sense of just how, how um, you are their best friend. You're the one who knows them more than they know themselves and loves them despite all their struggles, despite all their faults and failures. You love them and you love them like little children and you want to walk with all of us to help us grow up into more and more of the people that you created us to be. And we thank you for that um, and thank you for this time in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Phenomenal. Thank you. Oh, thanks, Julie. Please check out the links. I'll try to tack on some interviews, um, everything I can find. Oh, yeah. Uh, Imagineheaven.net. Um, there's, some, there's some interviews out there. Um, also, whatsafterlife.com. Um, What's After Life was a shorter version, really, to give away to skeptics. Um, mm -hmm. People won't read the whole uh, Imagine Heaven sometimes, but a shorter version. And what's after life are some of the personal interviews of the people in Imagine Heaven, you can see. 
out there. Amazing. And I know a lot of you wrote to me with tons of questions. I have a link to lots of common questions. A lot of your questions are in there. So I just wanted to hit some of the major big picture things. So heaven is amazing. And um, I just can't wait. <laughs> so I, I will until it's time. But uh, thank you for listening today. If you have a miracle that you'd like to share with me, please reach out to me at everydaymiraclespodcast.com is the website and everydaymiraclespodcast at gmail.com is my direct email. So thank you for listening and God bless. Mm-hmm.